Spoilers ahead. Watch out, and take care. As the movie begins in 1999, a gasping blood-covered bride lies wounded on the floor of a chapel. A hand wipes her face with a handkerchief, emblazoned with the words Bill in the corner. He explains to her that what he is about to do is a masochistic, rather than a sadistic act. The bride assures Bill that the child she is carrying is his, just before he shoots her in the head. Four years later, the bride, having survived, arrives at a suburban home in a yellow and red pickup truck, and walks to the front door. As soon as the door is opened, the bride looks at the woman in front of her, and has a flashback in which she slumps to the ground, and looks up to see the face of one of her attackers, Vernita Green. The bride punches her straight in the face, and they begin to fight. A violent brawl ensues, first with fists and then with knives. Vernita throws a small shelf over her and then flees to the kitchen. The action shifts to the kitchen. As they are preparing for a knife fight, a school bus arrives outside. As soon as Vernita's daughter gets inside, the women hide their blades and pretend nothing is wrong. They both assure the child that everything is fine and ask her to go to her room. The bride explains that she had a little girl Nikki's age. Vernita sends the girl to her room and offers the bride coffee. As they move to the kitchen, Vernita is introduced as a member of the Deadly Vipers, codenamed Copperhead. The bride, nicknamed Black Mamba, was also a member of that group. The bride expresses her desire for revenge, but vows not to harm Vernita in front of her daughter. Vernita explains that she has a new life and tries to soften the bride, but to no avail. She thirsts for revenge and has no intention of leaving her alone. Thus, they agree to fight this night in a duel to the death. Suddenly, Vernita discharges a concealed pistol at the bride as she prepares porridge for her child. She misses, and the bride kills her, throwing a dagger at her. Shortly, the daughter enters the kitchen. The bride apologizes, but adds that her mother deserved it. Finally, she tells her that if she cannot get over the murder when she grows up, she can come after her for revenge. Next, she returns to the van, which is labeled Pussy Wagon. She pulls out a list of people she must kill, drawing a line on Vernita and leaves. Four years earlier, authorities are investigating a mass murder that occurred at a wedding chapel in El Paso. The sheriff arrives and is informed that an execution-style massacre has occurred, with nine victims, including the bride, the groom, the priest and his wife, the guests, and even the pianist. The sheriff wanders around commenting on the massacre, then stops near the bride, and realizes that she is pregnant. The police quickly realize that she uses a false name, Arlene Machiavelli, so they just call her the bride. When he kneels down to examine her more carefully, she spits in his face. Subsequently, she is transported to the hospital, where she is in a coma. Next, a well-dressed blonde woman walks through the hospital while whistling a tune. She enters a dressing room and emerges dressed as a nurse, with a red patch over one eye and a tray containing a syringe. It is revealed that she is L driver of the Deadly Vipers, codenamed California Mountain Snake. She stands in front of the unconscious bride and declares, dying while sleeping is a luxury these days. Her phone rings as she prepares to insert the contents of the syringe into the IV. Bill orders her to cancel the mission, because the bride has survived despite their previous attempts to assassinate her. The fact is that killing her defenseless in her sleep would diminish their reputation. Elle is furious, but she follows orders and leaves the hospital. Four years later, the bride is still in a coma. A mosquito bites her, she screams and wakes up. In a flashback, she sees a gun pointing at her, and a bullet moving slowly toward her. She begins to feel her body, noticing first the metallic sound of her skull, and then the absence of the baby in her womb. She screams again and cries miserably. When she hears footsteps approaching, she lies down and pretends to sleep. A truck driver and an attendant enter. The attendant tells the trucker that this beautiful woman is available for whatever the trucker wants for $75. The man pays and is told he can do whatever he wants, as long as he doesn't leave any marks. The attendant leaves, and the man gets ready to have some fun. Soon after, we see her stained with blood, as the man lies dead on the ground. The bride tries to get out of bed but collapses, because her legs are too weak. When she hears the attendant return, she grabs a knife and crouches behind the closed door. He enters, stunned by the carnage and the empty bed. Then he falls to the floor after she cuts his heel. She slams the door in his face, and wants to know where Bill is. The name Buck on the janitor's nameplate brings back memories of his previous assaults. She hits him with the door again, trying to kill him, and then looks for his car keys. The keychain reads Pussy Wagon in a distinctive pink font. The bride, pushing her way to the basement parking lot in a wheelchair, recognizes Buck's yellow pickup. She drags herself inside and begins the arduous process of regaining leg movement. Another member of the Deadly Vipers group, Oranishi, 
codenamed Cottonmouth is introduced. Later, an anime chronicles the beginning of Oren's upbringing at the age of nine, when she witnesses the deaths of her parents. Her father, an American military commander, had attempted to fight Yakuza thugs, but was assassinated. Matsumoto, the Yakuza commander, also brutally killed Oren's mother. The last men start a fire in the room, and the house is burned to the ground. Oren survives and avenges the murders at young age, taking advantage of the fact that Matsumoto was into young. As the years go by, she becomes a world-class assassin. Since she also tried to kill her, she is next on the bride's list. Meanwhile, 13 hours pass, and the bride regains the use of her legs, so she embarks on her mission of revenge. She goes to the airport and takes off for Okinawa. She enters a Japanese sushi restaurant, where she has a long conversation with the cheerful bartender, and a bit of banter with his assistant. When the woman tells the bartender that she is looking for Hattori Hanzo, things take a dangerous turn. She explains that she needs Japanese steel to exterminate some bad people. He takes her to his attic, where he keeps a collection of samurai swords he made himself. When she tries one on, he informs her that they are not for sale, and that he created these katanas only as a hobby. Suddenly, he throws a baseball at her, and the bride cuts it in half easily. She explains that her enemy is a former student of his, and he correctly deduces that she is referring to Bill. Later, he agrees to build her a sword over the course of a month, and suggests that the bride use this time for training. A month later, we see Hanzo inspecting the new sword, which he considers his best work. He hands it over to the bride in a small solemn ceremony, admitting that he has broken his personal promise not to produce any more swords, but has done so because he believes in the bride's mission. Next, Oren is reintroduced as the new head of the Council of All Yakuza Lords. Her lieutenants are introduced, French-Japanese lawyer Sophie Fatal, another of Bill's protégés, her teenage bodyguard, Gogo Yubari, a vicious assassin dressed in a plaid school uniform, and Johnny Mo, the leader of his small army, the Crazy 88. When someone opposes Oren's candidacy, because of the fact that she is Chinese and Japanese-American, she beheads him and tells the others not to insult her past in any way, or else they will suffer the same fate. As she and her procession make their way to a restaurant, the bride arrives in Tokyo by plane. Next, we see the bride in a yellow jumpsuit and helmet riding a yellow motorcycle, as she chases Oren. As they stop at a traffic light, the protagonist notices Sophie in her car, and a flashback shows the woman calmly answering a phone call, while the bride is being slaughtered. When Oren and her immediate subordinates arrive at the restaurant, the owners escort them upstairs to a private dining room. The bride sits quietly at the bar and watches. Oren and her companions are enjoying themselves, when she senses a threat. She throws a small dart with a red tassel through the paper wall, hitting a beam in the hallway outside and startling the bride, who hides near the private room. Oren orders Gogo to go check on her, but the bride leans against the ceiling, and Gogo does not see her. Soon, the bride goes to the bathroom to remove her suit. She hears Auld Lang Syne, the only ringtone on Sophie's phone. The bride, accompanied by Sophie, noisily announces her presence from the restaurant floor, causing Oren and her group to rush to the balcony. As everyone watches, the bride cuts off Sophie's arm, causing chaos as guests and staff leave. Oren sends her group to kill the bride, but the first man is easily killed, after the bride cuts off his sword. Then she lifts him into the air with the sword and throws him into the pool. The next three henchmen try to attack at the same time, but they cannot even scratch the bride. Finally, Gogo is the last defense, and opposes the bride's sword with a ball and chain in a fierce fight. Gogo uses her ball and foot to disarm the bride, and knocks her on the ground. The bride is then forced to fight with a broken table leg. Nevertheless, the fight ends when the bride kills Gogo, table leg into her temple. The bride takes her blade and prepares for the duel with Oren, but they hear the sound of motorcycles and the crazy 88. Now the bride must kill all of them before she gets to the final boss. She slaughters most of the group, and then the action moves upstairs, where the lights are turned off. A long bloody dancing violent battle ensues, but in the end only one of the 88 survives, and the bride spanks him. The bride tells the defeated 88 madmen that they can leave, but they must leave behind their severed limbs, which now belong to her. She also orders Sophie to stay. Next, the bride and Oren engage in a long and hard-fought sword fight. As the duel begins, Oren questions the origins of the bride's sword. She succeeds in wounding the bride in the back, who falls to the ground weakened, but then gets up and succeeds in lethally wounding Oren. Finally, the bride triumphs by cutting off top of Oren's head, but before she dies, she apologizes for an earlier insult, and says that her sword is really a Hanzo. Later, the bride compiles her list of people she must kill, with Oren crossed out. Sophie is loaded into the car, 
and the bride takes her to a spot where she rolls her down a steep slope to the hospital. We find out that Sophie has been tortured by the bride, who has cut off her other arm, for information about the location of the other vipers and Bill. As the bride compiles her list, we see Sophie conversing with someone, whose face is obscured but unmistakably Bill. She tells Bill that she has told the bride everything she knows, because she was afraid of losing more limbs. She explains that the bride kept her alive so she could tell Bill everything that happened, and warn him that they would all die soon. The end. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. Turn on the notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out.